Welcome everyone and thank you for your patience as this video has taken much longer than anticipated to complete. I am pleased with the finished product and hope it will open your eyes to another domestic angle that addresses issues within family law and domestic violence. Let's dive right in. In this series of hidden motives, I have shared with you an objective approach to several theories and opinions that have been frequently discussed within social groups and television networks like Netflix and Lifetime. We have looked at things such as home decor, statistics on stalking, and even touched on the possibility that Shanann or Chris may have mentioned moving back to North Carolina. I have listened for years to many theories, both reasonable and somewhat questionable, yet something I will say is they are all plausible. In this video, I will be discussing how and why I believe both families have reacted and acted the way that they have over the years as well as the one theory I've not heard mentioned with a detailed legal explanation. What possible theory or motive would involve others and yet not have anyone else facing charges? Is this possible? The answer is yes, and we will discuss it right here. Let's get started. The following video is meant to inform and educate through critical thinking and should be used for entertainment and research purposes only. The names mentioned are found in public legal documents and available via public record and material is covered under the Fair Use Act. I will do my best to avoid full names, etc. to the best of my ability throughout the discussions and videos to keep the channel focused on the actual subject matter rather than an individual. My videos are not a call to action nor am I an attorney. The topics discussed in this video may be sensitive or triggering for some viewers. If you or someone you know are a victim of domestic violence or a crime, please contact your local law enforcement agency or a hotline. There is a number provided in the description below. Here at the House Huddle, we discuss true crime cases and the public health issues found within each case. In Hidden Motives Part 1, we see this clip where the officer Check of the house, house asks Chris set. about her family. Let's listen real oh. quick. Um, any friends she, that you know she would be hanging out with? I mean, I know, I guess her, her, Amanda, her uh, parents are out parents of state. Across, across country, North Carolina. Oh. Yeah, so that's not happening. She can play with her. All the girls are blanking, they're gone. Now we know that Shanann was adamant in her earlier Facebook post prior to marrying Chris that she was ready to get far away from North Carolina. Cindy, Chris's mother, has mentioned she felt like Shanann ripped Chris away from North Carolina and his family. Many have made this to be surprising, yet, you know, it happens all the time. Cindy Watts isn't the first and she won't be the last mother, mother to not like her daughter-in-law. And we don't know that relationship fully. There are three sides to every story. His side, her side, and the truth. What do you think? Would it be more likely that Chris suggested moving back to North Carolina to be close to family? Do you think his infatuation with Kessinger genuinely was enough to cost him his children? It's evident Shanann had already discussed with an attorney in March of 2018 regarding moving out of state and divorcing with kids in Colorado. I did a little research and discovered that this attorney is in fact legitimate and it's my opinion his interview account was genuine. His bar information is public on Google and other search engines. Initially, I thought maybe she had pondered leaving Colorado for North Carolina, but the more I revisited texts and posts, it appeared to be the opposite. Chris wanted the kids to spend more time with his family, however, after the nut incident, Shanann put a stop to the girls being around his family. As we will see, once they returned from North Carolina, there was an effort on Shanann's part to mend the issue with his parents but it would appear that the last fight before Arizona really set into motion the events we would all come to know. Would this looming divorce be enough to send her back to a place she couldn't wait to get out of? Regardless, the decision was being made independent of each other as to what the next move would be. The mention of moving comes up again while they are in North Carolina visiting with family. Shanann states in her text with friends that they had the discussion that he was to find a place when they got back to Colorado and that she was putting the house on the market. 
This, in my opinion, is why all the hype about him communicating with the realtor didn't really come across as alarming to me. We continue to see via text the back and forth between Shanine and Chris that something is very, very wrong in their marriage. We know that during this time, Chris is also pondering his relationship and future with Kessinger. It's my personal opinion that in the final week, the pendulum of decisions swung back and forth so quickly that each second, everything changed. There is some weight to Chris stating, I knew I should have gone to the Rockies game that evening. There is evidence that while Chris originally was open to searching for apartments with Kessinger, once they returned from North Carolina, he was no longer interested in looking at apartments. Kessinger is heard here in this interview with law enforcement stating she didn't understand that he wasn't really as interested in the apartments as he had been previously. Uh, did I cloud? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I mean, some messages came over, so I assume that everything is, but I don't really know. So maybe I'm not as happy as I thought. What do you remember? You just said you remember something besides that. Were you oh, you want to have a conversation right now? He's an agent. He okay. works with me. He, he knows about this. I can too. step out if you feel more comfortable. Oh, it, no, I mean, what, it's I okay, don't know. It, Whatever. You, you tell me. Work. He had a fire stick. He kept talking about, you know what a fire stick is? Yeah. Okay, you probably do since you're a tech guy. They're like... Okay. Oh, you mean like an Amazon fire yeah, stick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so he didn't have it in his possession, but on Who's Saturday... Who's he, though? Chris? Yes. So Chris mentioned to me that on Saturday, that same day, um, that... Oh, because this kind of went hand in hand with the whole, like, apartment talk. I was like, oh, that apartment that he said he found, uh, he was like, I was like, well, what's it called? And he's like, I don't remember. And I was like, well, how much is it? He's like, it's close to 1100 And I was really taken back by that because I pay more than that. And I don't really have that nice of a place. And it's not a two bedroom. It's a one. So that part kind of seemed odd to me, but I'd seen a few things online that were kind of cheap, and I was just like, all right, and he's like, I'm just trying to cut costs, and I was like, that's cool, I was like, how else are you doing that, and it was just out of curiosity, and he's like, well, I decided to get rid of cable, and I was like, okay, and I was kind of taken back by that too, because he loves sports, dude, like, lives and breathes football, so I, uh, I was like, okay, and I was like, that's a good cost to, you know, to cut back on, and he was like, yeah, I think I can watch, still stream sports via a fire stick, and I've heard of those things before, I don't really know a lot about them, um, but he was saying that he had a buddy working on it already for him. Who's the buddy? He didn't say, I didn't ask. Why do you think that's important? that he had all that set up? I don't know. I mean, it made me believe that... That he was ready to move out? Is that... Oh, I get what you're saying. Yeah, like he was prepping. It still sounded like he was prepping. I mean, everything he did sounded like he was getting ready for everything to happen. The only thing that I found really peculiar about the whole situation was the fact that he just kind of seemed disconnected about the apartment thing on Saturday, whereas in previous conversations, he was the one who brought it up, and he was the one who seemed really excited about it when I offered to help him do some, like, legwork on trying to find him a spot for him and his girls. Right. I'll be right back. Okay. So, I don't, I don't know who his friend was. It was just weird, because sometimes it seemed like some of the things he said, he was still really, a lot of things he said made sense. It still to this day makes sense. And then other things that he said don't make sense at all to me anymore. Or like they changed, you know? Her. Well, you know a lot more now. Well, unfortunately, you know a lot more now about terrible things that may have happened that changed the way you're thinking about what he said, too. So, making you think differently about those kind of, that verbiage. Right? Okay. So, I think we, we've talked a lot about a lot of different things. I hope I'm helping you guys. <laughs> you certainly are. 
I hope so, because I'm so, I don't like having this stuff on the top of my head. It's so hard, and so many days I can tell that my mind is trying to, like, block it all out right now, and I think it's almost like a subliminal, like, coping mechanism, and I'm trying not to. I'm trying to, like, think about it so that I can help you guys, and I just, that's why I... So why don't you give yourself a break for a day or two? And just live a normal life. Stop thinking about this stuff for a day or two and then revisit it. Maybe that'll help you because you look like you're tired again. I lost <laughs> my job yesterday, so that's where that comes from. You can, lost your job with the geosciences place as well? Okay, sorry to hear that. With, I think you mentioned with your skill set that you should be easily employable in another uh, locale. I don't know. I don't know. I hope somebody hires me. I hope people don't see my name on a resume and just not hire me. Well, your name hasn't even made it in the papers yet. Not yet. So, remember you said that you had some locations you could go out of state? Maybe. Yeah. I don't know if that's what you're thinking or whatever is going to work for you. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking a lot about all of that. It's just a matter of timing and trying to figure out when to do it. I'm hesitant to do it all too soon. I'm going to have to do it all over again. Tell me the name of the geosciences company. I forget. Tasman. Tasman, that's right. I think I was just so bummed because they told me that they would keep me and then they called me back and let me go and I was just like, man. So did they... Now that I've allowed that video to play a little longer than needed for this video, but that's just so you have the full context of Kessinger in that moment of the interview. You are more than welcome to replay it as needed. Up to this point, I've shared with you some of the progression through 2018 that seems to have begun back in March. We know from Discovery that Watts had already been on Kessinger's radar, or at the very least, she was aware of Shanann and Chris Watts since 2017. Where this chance encounter happened or how she came to search them prior to ever meeting them is still an unanswered question. Besides my opinion that the affair started at the very least emotionally in 2017, she looked up Shanann to see if he quote unquote looked like he was getting divorced because I do believe it was Chris that mentioned in the prison interview that he did those videos, you know, just to help out with the business because he didn't want to hurt the income and that it was all essentially a front was the explanation. This would make sense to cover for those earlier months. Maybe in 2017, it was just a friend or a flirty girl at the gym. But regardless, we know she didn't start Anna Darko until 2018 and Chris was in Colorado approximately six months before Shanian sold the house in North Carolina. This brings me to the more descriptive timeline. While I did my best to include as much as possible, I also wanted to make sure it was more than just what's been discussed before. As you will learn with this theory, the back and forth, the uncertainty, the emotional battle going on between each person involved, it's safe to say we may never fully know what happened that morning and the days following, but what we can do is review the timeline and discuss the seemingly small things that resulted in fatal and a huge loss. We will use st statistics as well as I'll share my personal experience that led me to this topic. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and like the video. It's a quick and free way to support the channel and I greatly appreciate it. The earliest documented starting point was when Kessinger searched both Chris and then Shanine Watts in 2017. As we dive into this timeline, I will share details on certain dates where more information was discovered as I gathered the information for this video. Please feel free to drop your comments along the way with any questions or additional information. Please keep these comments kind and objective. I will put, pull this video and comments together for a live discussion at a later date so we can discuss them all together. Let's now shift our focus on the motive theory topic for this video. In efforts to maintain focus, I don't want to sidebar off the Watts case too much. However, I do want to share a little bit about my own personal experience with this subject. It's a nightmare that I've personally lived and thankful to be able to share that my son is healthy, safe, and thriving. His father and I now have a very healthy relationship. 
In my opinion, this gives credible merit to several of the theories out there, yet also provides a legal loophole for others that may have been potentially involved that fateful morning. In this sweet video, you'll see our son almost a year after the abduction. We are now able to watch the video, smile, and enjoy the sweet sound of his voice. Together, we now have a teenager that is a thriving honor roll and varsity high school athlete. This was the first time he ever said the word grasshopper. It's still probably my favorite video. Huh? What is it? Touch it. What is that? A little dish. A grasshopper. A grass. Grasshopper. A grasshopper. Touch Oh, I can't touch it. Yeah, you can. He'll just jump. Yeah, right there. There he goes. Why mention this and what does it have to do with this case? Let's start with the first video that most of us ever saw, the porch interview. It can be found online if you wish to watch the full version. In a random conversation about my channel, my ex-husband and I began discussing this interview. Interestingly enough, he and I agreed on our opinion of the interview. We discussed his body language and while he's supportive of the channel, He's not really been in tune with the Watts case. He kind of knew like the main narrative that's been out there. And, but something he brought to my attention that, you know, I was like, wow, okay, we actually have the same thought about it, was that Chris doesn't look worried about anything, especially the girls. He's more so annoyed during the interview. Resentful is another word that comes to mind. Now, some will say he was annoyed at Atkinson and, and the publicity, but take a moment and think back to how this all played out in front of us. I do want to reiterate regarding this case that this is a theory based on the evidence that has been provided via the discovery, Shanann's public Facebook post, interviews, audio visuals, as well as statistics and case law from Colorado. I know these laws to be legal and enforceable having lived through it myself confirming and confirming with case law in Colorado. So let's begin with the legal side of this, because no matter where you stand on the topic, it is legal in Colorado and Florida to take your own children and essentially flee with them. Family law number one, in order to avoid either parents from fleeing with a child or children, you must have a signed court order visitation agreement or parenting plan in place. This can be temporary and easily amended. You do not have to have a finalized divorce for this and any good family law attorney will express the importance and significance of this typically in the first consultation or meeting. Let's review Colorado law regarding the issue just to keep this fact based. This simple Google search of Colorado law will, with regards to moving with children without a parenting plan is a great place to start to verify this information. Again, I'm not an attorney or lawyer, and if this subject matter is something you're dealing with personally, I cannot stress enough the importance for you to make a simple phone call to a local family attorney who can inform you of your rights according to your state. Any law enforcement officer will tell you a parent taking a child during a divorce is a civil matter, and they do not get involved with those issues. Again, it's a civil matter, it's not criminal. An adult leaving of their own free will is not a crime. They were being careful not to infringe upon Shanann's rights as both an adult as well as a mother. It is not criminal to take your own child. Eventually, that parent would have to return to the jurisdiction to proceed with legal matters regarding the divorce and even custody courts. 
However, there is nothing law enforcement can do to prevent that parent from leaving with their child unless a crime has been committed during the process. If the parent is on the birth certificate, then they have equal rights to the child or children. Let this be public service announcement number one for this episode, and that is if you are not married and you have a child together, this applies to you as well. It is a great idea to protect the well-being of the child with a standing custody agreement. Even if it's simply 50-50 and you live together for 80 years, happily ever after, never have to use it. It protects the child from ever being in that situation. Not to mention, it's in my opinion a great proactive approach to avoid these types of crimes from happening. Raising awareness and educating parents could be the key to avoiding some unforeseen domestic violence issues within the family unit. As we summarize the year of 2018, we will come full circle to the benefit of having a standing visitation agreement in place. We have prenups and postnups to protect our things. Why in the world do we not encourage parenting plans to protect the family unit, both individually and as a whole? As we review the timeline leading up to the disappearance of Shanann, Bella, Cece, and Nico, pay attention to the back and forth waves of emotional manipulation. The whirlwind of destruction and wreckage that an affair has in all its phases on a family doesn't come without fatalities. If you're lucky, the only fatality is a spouse's trust or the marriage. In this case, it was so much more. Here we go. June 7, 2017 was the Metallica concert that Chris and Shanann attended together. This was a big surprise that Shanann put together for Chris, and it was something they both dressed up for. No alarms of concern at this point. I did search back beyond this date, however, for the purposes of this video, I felt this was a great starting point. It's my personal opinion or theory that initial contact between Kessinger and Chris, or even possibly Shanann, was clearly made in 2017. I more firmly believe Watts and Kessinger met originally when he moved to Colorado before Shanann sold the house in North Carolina. But that is strictly speculation and that part is my opinion. We see that on August 3rd, 2017, Kessinger searches for Chris Watts. Take note of this date. It's always been my opinion that August played a significant role in this crime, especially with regards to Kessinger and Watts. More so, excuse me, more so along the lines of an anniversary date than anything. Kessinger had a thing about firsts, and if the timeline serves us correctly, then this would put their first anniversary in August of 2018. August 29th, Shanann had her neck surgery. September 1st, 2017, Kessinger searches for Shanann Watts, and again in January 2018. Keep in mind, at this time, both Shanann and Chris had public Facebook and Instagram accounts. The fact that she looked him up first and then looked Shanann up by name makes me think she either saw his Facebook, where he was married, or they spoke about Shanann by this point. It could have been an innocent conversation where Chris said, my wife's name is Shanann Watts. Who knows? If this were the case, it would give rise to the possibility that the first 10 to 11 days in August were significant to Kessinger and Watts. September 2017. Shanann participated in a local health fair. Given the significance of Kessinger searching for Shanann, this would be an interesting line of questioning if Miss Meacham would be open to an interview. She was living with Chris and Shanann during the time, or during this time, and to learn of their family dynamics during that time, beyond what's in the police interview. Does Kessinger's photos look familiar from the health fair? You know, like, did they possibly maybe bump into her? Does she, did it just, did she see her picture and just say, oh, she looks familiar? Be kind of curious about that. October 2017, was Shanann and Chris's Thrive Trip Excuse me. <laughs> October 2017 was Shanann and Chris's thrive trip to Port- Puerto Vallarta. The, the photos of this trip look like a honeymoon paradise. Their body language together and photos appear genuine and not staged or uncomfortable. 
This is one of the first factual observations that leads me to believe that Kessinger set her sights on Watts and pursued him. November 18, 2017, Shanann posts a video telling her story about her Thrive experience. During this video, Chris is very supportive, unlike the later videos where he seems annoyed. This appears to be a moment where the two of them are in her office while she does a quick live after putting the kids to bed. Nothing in this video would give rise to any outside or underlying issue. So while I do believe it's proven that Kessinger was lurking in the shadows and behind a keyboard, at this point it doesn't appear, in my opinion, that she had broken the threshold of their marriage. Um, as you, some of you know me, um, know how much the Thrive experience has changed my life. My husband's life, he's sitting right over there. Um, you can come say hi, you know. Um, <laughs> he's being camera shy. I'm watching live too. <laughs> you silly. Um, so, I, um, <laughs> as some of you guys know, I started a Thrive Experience last January. Chris and I both started at the same time. Um, one, I would never have done a live video. Uh, two, um, I was very scared to talk November to people. 20, November 21st, 2017. Both Chris and Shanian are in a Thrive video. Something I did notice about this video was while Chris appeared to participate, he looked a little tired, which could be normal, but then his attention spikes when she mentions the word or the name Chris. She's like reading in her comments on her video when she mentions Chris. I like like four or five pieces of ice cubes, like three or four pieces of ice cubes in mine. Can't smell it. But look, I'm so excited for you, Shannon. Uh, I'm gonna shoot you a message when I get off here. I just put the kids down. Don't mind me, guys. I'm in my uh, pajamas already because it's bedtime. It smells good. Oh my god. Smell that. Mm, that's good. Christina says it tastes like my favorite ice cream. I'm so excited. I love green mint ice cream. It's my absolute favorite. And it's not just mint ice cream. It has to be green mint. Um, because, yeah, I'm weird like that. So, I am so excited. And all you do is shake, shake, shake. Kids are down. They're going to be jealous because, yeah. I'm so excited. Oh my goodness. It does smell like my favorite ice cream. I'm only going to give Chris a little bit because I don't think I'm going to want to share this. Ah, ready? Here it goes. It's just like mint ice cream. Oh my goodness. This is absolutely amazing. It literally tastes, if you guys have ever had green mint ice cream, it tastes like green mint ice cream. Like, just like it. Delicious. Mm. That is really, food? really good. I don't know why he's crying. He wants, he wants to, to lay on, he wants to sit on the car. Charlie, it tastes like green mint ice cream. Have you gotten yours yet? Oh my god, it's so good. It's like 7 o'clock at night here. I love this. This is going to be like my dessert at night. Hey, Lisa. I'm not ignoring you guys. If I didn't see your message, I'm sorry. Um, it is amazing. Absolutely, positively amazing. This is probably my new favorite. Like, oh, wow. Michelle, it's amazing. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try this tomorrow. So be prepared. I'm going to go live tomorrow. I'm gonna try it with this. Hold on. Uh oh. What are you trying? Oh. Cafe. Oh my goodness, it's gonna be amazing. Um. Oh, Chris, that stinks. It, it's amazing. Let me just tell you, it's absolutely positively amazing. Um. Are you talking to me? No, different Chris. There's a lot of Chris's. Hey, Melissa, did you get yours yet? It's so good, girl. Michelle, when is yours? Uh, look when it's supposed to be delivered. Okay, that's absolutely amazing. Candy Cane Lifestyle Mix. Candy Cane Lifestyle Mix. And it's healthy. Like, seriously healthy. 
Oh my goodness, it doesn't get better than this. They never, never, ever disappoint. Um, never, ever. I'm so excited. Okay, guys, so that is our candy cane lifestyle mix. It's absolutely amazing. I know they sold out, so I don't know if they got more coming in. I do have three, three extras. Um, it could be something, it could be nothing. I watched this video before, it didn't really jump out to me until I was finalizing this video. Might be something you'd like to go back and look at, and I'd love to know what you think. His little ears perk up when she mentions Chris in the comments, and um, she tells him something along the lines of, no, there's other Chris's. No. Anything that is in red is from Kessinger. Black is typically just my narration. Blue is from Chris, and purple is Shanann. Just to kind of give you a little bit of a key code there. But November 22nd, 2017 is the Mean Faces video. This is the video where we see Shanann baking and interacting with her team and her family. At one point in the video, she pauses and addresses the Mean Faces. Her demeanor completely shifts. You can see this video and clip in part one of Hidden Motives. It's pretty much the first half of the video, but you can definitely see a shift in her demeanor during that video. November 23rd, 2017, Shanine mentions the next day in another live video that Chris bought her some pretty flowers and they can be seen on the kitchen counter. Several of us have speculated whether or not he purchased those flowers to reassure her she had nothing to worry about. No, you're not getting down. Oh, please. Cece, be careful. Manage. No, no, Cece. I miss something. Thanks. Chris got them for me yesterday for fun. Are you good? Are you doing good, kid? I like colorful flowers. Do you like the flowers, Bella? No. November 29th, 2017. Shanine and Chris are in their Steelers jerseys for another Thrive video. Chris appears more rested in his... It's my opinion, we can get a better baseline of him when we compare all the videos. In this one, he is supportive and genuinely smiling and laughing with Shanine, but then, you know, obviously you get those long pauses where he doesn't really have to say anything because she's pitching the sale. I do believe some may have looked too much into this in efforts to point out how bitter he was or how he was already like distancing himself from her. Um, so, you know, it's amazing what you can do with um, Thrive and how it gives you the energy and mental clarity. Um, how are you watching and you're sitting right here? I'm right here. <laughs> Weirdo. Uh -huh. um, so Chris has lost a significant amount of weight um, since you pounds. started Thrive. How yeah, much? 50 pounds. And he's in a medium. He went from a 2X to a medium. And that was before, most of it was before Duo. Oh, yeah, all of it was. Um, and Duo is new. So, you know, filling in those nutri <laughs> nutritional gaps, um, helping your body, you know, feed itself with the premium nutrition helps your body um, crave less. Um, you definitely eat healthier. Um, we haven't changed our diet. As you see, I've eaten. We've eaten banana bun bread this week. Mm -hmm. We've had cup, uh, brownies. Um, and, you know, I'm sneaking in candy corn here and there. So, um, <laughs> so um, it's amazing. Uh, Thrive has a lot of benefits for everybody. Go Chiefs. Um, who won that game a couple weeks ago? I believe the Steelers won that game, <laughs> if I recollect. Love you, Jess. Um, so, 
Um, I'm waiting. She's a diehard Chief fan. Diehard. Um, so if you guys want more information, if you are um, looking to try it, shoot me a message. If you're one of Chris's friends, um, shoot him a message and he can get you some more information as well. Um, we have two spots left for either the cafe for free um, or your DFT, regular DFT. So shoot me a message. Thanks everyone for hopping on. I see a lot of my faves are on here. Um, Nikki, I sent you a message. Um, Amy, I saw your message. I'll respond back here in just a minute. <laughs> Who else is on that I missed? Okay. So Amy's sending us some Steeler stuff. I got to send her some money too. Thrive forever. Yes. Yes. It's amazing. Um, so Christina just jumped on. Hi, Christina. Hey, I'm shoot sending over uh, Cece's smallest jersey for you to put on Coral. Um, <laughs> Tell DJ if he doesn't have a jersey for her, we're getting a um, Palomalu jersey. Palomalu jersey. Perfect size for coral. This still fits um, CC, so tight. So you better tell <laughs> you better tell uh, DJ he better hurry up and get her whatever jersey you guys like. Um, so Amy, that's coming your way too because CC's um, grown out of it. It's a Palomalu 12 month jersey, but it still fits her and she's a chunk. It's good luck jersey. It is a good luck jersey, so yeah. we haven't parted with it yet because it's good luck. So, um, does anyone have any questions that's new and uh, would like? You can use credits today, so if you have Laval credits, you can use um, credits to buy the duo, DFT duo. Um, so, yeah, I think that's it. Anyone have any questions? More once, more twice. I forget what else I was going to say. I want a cafe right now with my lifestyle mix though. All right. So McKenna will have plenty of time to wear it because it's, um, you know how they're larger, they wear a larger, so. Um, all right, so shoot me a message. Um, I'm gonna go celebrate with a piece of banana nut bread. <laughs> Just kidding, um, maybe. So <laughs> if you guys have, sh shoot me questions, if you guys have any questions, thanks for hopping on. Um, go Steelers and talk to you guys soon. Hey, um, Christina, call us tonight about 6.30 our time. No, Eastern. 6.30, 6 our time? Yeah, yeah 6.30. We'll start the chant. Oh, girl, she's teeny tiny. It'll perfectly fit her. If Cece's wearing this now and she's in 3T, she'll totally be able to wear it in a, for a while. Um, it's just worn. It's definitely worn. Bella's worn it. Cece's worn it. It's, it's our favorite jersey. So, mm -hmm. um... Anyone, oh, that's what I want to say. Anyone is interested in earning over $1,300 in um, legit cash and bonuses, um, shoot me a message. I company offers a huge incentive, um, perfect time for Christmas. So if you're ready to um, start, it's free. You can promote the company for free. Um, you can be a customer for free. So shoot me a message. I'd love to help you. I'd love to give you at least the information so you can kind of decide what you want to do. You can thrive for free. Uh, we've been thriving for free for 20 months. So super, super awesome. Um, so talk to you guys later. Hey, Jess. I saw you hop on. Um, I think that's it. Shanann does post videos on New Year's Eve and in January. We know in January is the vision board party where she where we've seen photos of T. McCoy and his wife. This is the first time we see Anna Darko employees inside the Watts home. By January 13th, she mentions the Thrive trip she and Chris will be taking to Las Vegas. Aside from the girls having a cold, January appeared to be rather uneventful. February 7th, Chris and Shanann take their trip to Vegas. This video of Shanann driving the Tesla is one that I found endearing among many. In this clip, Chris is the one recording, and you can hear him mention that he has the best seat in the house when he's referring to his angle or, or view of Shanann. That's a pretty cool key. Oh, that's really cool, yeah. You walk up to the car, the whole car will unlock and pull out. If you drive the Model X, you can walk up to your car and the door will open up for you as well as close. And then that Model X also has the Falcon doors that come out like wings and come back down. So you're going to turn right and be set to light.
That's just the sort of question. Um, well, I was just thinking the bigger one. Like yeah, so um, the Model SUV. X. Yeah, the mo that's the Model X. Got it. So that comes with um, up to seven uh, seats. You can customize nice. the way up for that. Um, that's one of the thousands of doors. Comes with how many seats? Seven. 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 That's definitely the one you're getting. Yeah. yeah. So you can put that's two in the middle good. and three in the back. You can put three in the middle, two in the back, and the two in the back, which you can with one. So you have the, an open cargo area. That's nice. Um, you also have an engine in the front, so you have a tiny storage space in the front for tools and things like that. Um, like right now, I have a backpack. Right here. Yeah, you can turn right here. You have a backpack in where? In the front. In the front? Yeah, so the front doesn't have any, so we can't that's turn right sweet. on red. But when we do turn, stay in the right lane like we did here, and you can kind of punch it if you like. Oh, she is going to. <laughs> but you're going to have some good. The light is short, so when you get to that light, that's when we're turning right. So you kind have a short space to do that. You look really good driving this. Yeah. And a great oh, view. <laughs> you also have like the uh, surrounding uh, camera sensors. You'll always be alerted on cars in front of you. On it's a sweet gesture he openly makes on the live video. As of this point, personally, I've not seen anything that's alarming. But then something is noticeably off, in my opinion, almost immediately upon their return. The pie in the face video marks one of the first where, in my opinion, it was noticeable Chris was less than thrilled with family activities. Only a couple of weeks later leads us to March 4th. It's my opinion that by March 2018, the quote-unquote friend was exposed. This makes sense when we read Shanann's March 4th post and even more when we consider Chris's account of how Shanann reacted when a similar occurrence happened when they were dating. Let's listen to Chris's yeah. response was, in the uh, prison interview. Did she get fiery like that? Only once in our entire relationship I've ever seen her that, that way. Yeah. And that was... The, a time before, or was that on the night that it happened? No, it was uh, right back in North Carolina. Oh. It was one, it was just like one of those, just, it was just a fiery argument that yeah. I never, like, I never raised my voice to her or anything. And, like, you know, I, like, I just got mad and I slammed the door, and she was like, God, I'm like, should have slammed the door. Is that when you were in North Carolina that last week? No, it was like, like previous to that. It was like 2010, 2011. Oh. It was like early, early, early. Okay. In her old house. Before kids? Yes. Were you dating or were you married at that point? Dating. Oh. Yeah, it was just like, I, I, I don't remember what it was about. I think some, I think some girl maybe texted me like from my past or something. And like, I was just like, this. And, and she was like, you know, don't have that happen again. And I'm just like, I can't have friends. Right. They're females. Like, right. I don't even talk to this little bit anymore. Right. And it was just like, yeah. Nope. Was she fiery? Did she have that Italian blood that her mom has? Lord, yes. And <laughs> <laughs> was she always? So he mentions that she either kicked him out of the house or out of their bedroom. But, you know, this was before they were married and before they had kids. Do you sense some similarities here? Keep in mind that the text scene on Netflix where she states, he's never been like this unless he was getting it somewhere else. I've always questioned the context of that message from Shanann. Now fast forward to 2018. They've been married since 2012, so six years, have two children with one on the way. They have built this life together. Judge it how you may, but keep in mind many families in the United States are in more debt than they were at any given time. So it's my request to keep the judgments on their finances to a minimum in the comments, please. The heart of the matter were the kids. We hear over and over that Shanann was an attentive mother Chris was a doting father. Both were great with the kids. Even from the mistress. She defends Shanann and Chris when it comes to the kids. She can't stand to say her name, yet she can't speak ill of her either. They have this beautiful family, and now this parasite that's emerged in the form of another woman is threatening the life of this marriage and this home. Shanann posts a photo with a caption of her accomplishments for the day. Rereading the post with the context of what was going on at the time makes me ponder if that was the day it was decided Chris would be sleeping in the basement. Something happened prior to that dinner with the attorney that provoked Shanann to be so direct with a stranger. She recognized an opportunity to educate herself and for someone who enjoyed reading and already knowing the devastation of divorce 
Something happened that had her being cautious about what life would be like without Chris. Here I put the coleslaw mattered. That's, that's a new video coming, if not a blog post, based off of something Frankie Jr. said in, um, in his interview with police. You'll hear me mention it a few times, and then I will bring it full circle when I post that video as well. This post, in my opinion, was a turning point in their marriage, where at the very least the parasite was exposed. Some would argue that if Shania knew about Kessinger, that she would have said something to her family or to her friends. But I challenge you to look at the location of these family and friends. You know, they're all kind of scattered. Think about another example of this. If you ever watched Newlyweds with Nick Lachey and Jessica Simpson, and then read her book titled Open Book, you will see another example of a woman who loved her husband in marriage so much that she wanted it to quote unquote appear perfect to those watching. It's not a crime case of murder, but it is an even earlier example of a marriage on display for viewers before we ever had Facebook followers. The discrepancy with the image versus reality was birthed with reality TV. Isn't this essentially what social media has now created for anyone using a platform? We either see nothing but good, silence during the bad, an image upheld at all costs, and sometimes those costs are the lives of those we love. It's just not worth it. Going back to Shanann, her Facebook posts remain thrive focused and she battles the stomach bug with the girls, yet she doesn't look well rested again for a few months. This could very easily be the first trimester draining her as well. March 10th and 11th. This must have been a good day or night or something else behind the scenes. It appears that publicly Shanann is praising Chris and his smiles appear genuine. It's my opinion that more and more quote-unquote conversations were being had about the female that would not go away. March 25th. There is a get-together in Greeley, Colorado, and Shanann mentions meeting at random two other customers at different tables. This was the one at the Fuzzy Taco. Uh, you can see the photos um, on Shanann's page. Um, and let me pause real quick just to go back up to um, the comment about, you know, with her being tired and whatnot. Some of the tiredness and exhaustion once she is pregnant could be accounted for that. Um, I did not want to allude to that she was pregnant prior to that. So just throwing that out there. Um, I do think some of her pictures where she looks tired, some of it is exhaustion, no doubt from the pregnancy, but I do think she was battling a whole other demon at home. So moving on, March 25th, we covered the get together at the Fuzzy Taco. March 26th, she posts to Facebook, when your ex says, let's try to rekindle the flame. It's like a little video. Um, it's funny, but uh, the irony here is that Miller's wife comments on this post in Shanann's comments. Um, it's clearly seen as a funny post, but folks don't usually post something like that without being provoked. Again, something was revealed during this time that didn't sit well with either Chris or Shanann. The whole quote, he thought a baby would fix his feelings, almost comes across as Shanann compromising to have another baby because she may have stepped out and he was trying to get his head back in it. But that cannot be confirmed and is merely the other side of an argument for the mere purpose of remaining objective. Simply put, both parties are more than capable of stepping outside their marriage. I am not saying that that's what happened. I am saying that there was something latching on to this marriage that would not let it go. March 27th. Shania must be feeling a little sassy as she posts, she wants to go dancing and who wants to go with her? In addition to this, there are additional Thrive posts with family tagged. She also makes a post about a recent snowfall. Okay, so keeping in mind, sometime during March 2018, Shanann spoke with the attorney at the Hibachi restaurant. This is confirmed in Discovery, and the attorney is a reputable attorney in the area with ties back to North Carolina. He is legit and not just there creating false reports, as some people have said. 
this is probably the earliest we have of like have any suggestion of trouble brewing being corroborated from an outside source. I'd really like to know who was that friend that she was with at the hibachi restaurant and why have they never spoken out about that evening. This is just a primary example of how we don't know everything and there are other people who had some insight into what was actually going on at the household much sooner and much earlier on. Again, it's not to say that anyone could have spoken up and said anything that could have prevented something necessarily, um, but I think it gives a false narrative to say that no one even knew that they were having difficulties or problems. So moving into April 2018, the girl seemed to come down with some kind of, you know, just the typical colds and ear infections. This is also where a pattern begins to emerge. A trip for Shanann and Chris to quote unquote recharge uh, seems to be a normal thing for them. And for some time it's worked. They go away, they reconnect and recharge as parents, then return home, you know, to loving on the girls and going back to work. This sounds like the perfect formula, and it is, until the parasite is exposed. In my opinion, this is... In my opinion, this is why the highly scrutinized Thrive trip with Miller was thrust into the spotlight. Do I believe she was cheating on Chris Watts? I'm about 80% sure she was not. I do believe that if she knew about Kessinger, then it may initiate an attempt to make Chris Watts jealous. This is supported, in my opinion, by the videos we see from this trip where on more than one occasion you hear Shanann mentioning Miller's arms and how strong he was. It's my opinion that her comments and praises were personally a bit much, and if I were his wife I probably would have felt uncomfortable with it, but I'm not married to him and I don't know what their friendship or relationship was through the years. I have, you know, guy friends that I grew up with since elementary school and I wouldn't think anything of it if it were them. Uh, if you put it in the context of a love interest or someone you're interested in, you know, as far as romantically, then it makes it, you know, obviously inappropriate. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't believe Chris was even bothered by it because he was already preoccupied. By April 12th, the trip to North Carolina for six weeks was planned. Again, after listening to Frank's interview with police, Shanann originally planned to come for just a couple of weeks, and then eventually she called, called him back and said, hey, we're just going to come for six weeks. And, you know, he said he didn't think much of it at the time. He was like, okay, great, you know, we'd love to see you. April 24th, she posts about local law enforcement using Thrive and earning a $400 bonus, but no comments are found beneath this post. This is clearly supposed to be a post to potentially bring in new thrivers. Were the comments removed or did the post just not generate any leads? I'm not really sure about the answer to that one. April 25th, there's a post about Bella's hair and there's about 53 comments that are uplifting Bella. This is also the same day that she posts photos of her visit to the nail salon. She is proudly displaying her new nail art with her wedding ring in full. You can absolutely clearly see her wedding ring. I mention this because of a couple of things. This is around the time some of her Thrive posts weren't getting as many hits, which no doubt could have indicated a drop in sales or earnings, etc. It's also around this time that Shanann is more noticeably posting photos of her with her wedding ring on display. It may mean nothing. It may mean something. Again, the coleslaw mattered. April 26. There are posts about Shanann getting ready for Thrive of Palooza. This is this trip that Chris Watts did not attend, yet Chris Miller does. This is also the trip that raised all the questions about why the paternity test has not been released. However, creating this video, I feel I've come to an idea of another angle. Shanann posts... A photo of her and Atkinson at the airport ready to depart for Thrive of Palooza. April 27th is a big day for Shanann. She is recognized as a leader. Sadly, she is not sharing this with her husband. 
again, you can hate on the MLM all you want, but to reach a level of that recognition took some work and success. That would have been something to share with your spouse. This is obviously not knocking Watts at this point. It sits very well that he was at home with a girl so she could attend this trip. However, it's my opinion that by this time, Kessinger had already been exposed. Shanian already knew there was something inappropriate going on or else she would not have inquired so intently about divorce with the children in Colorado as discussed previously. Keeping with the date of April 27th, this is that infamous Lenny Kravitz concert where Shanian displays that leopard dress that is mentioned in question when she's discussing with friends the conception of Nico. Now, this has typically been taken as, you know, it could mean something happened between Miller and Shanian, but in my opinion, it can also be seen as, you know, Shanian had been trying to get Chris's, Chris Watts' attention and get him to miss her, and maybe the leopard, pr leopard print dress did it for him. And she conceived immediately upon return. I mean, there's there's two different, you know, angles to that. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Be kind, and if you don't have anything objective and constructive to say about this topic, then please just say nothing. I do want to note that on this day, Shanine started an online, quote-unquote, challenge to post an I Love My Spouse post for seven days. We only see one. It could simply be that she, like most of us, uh, just forgot to finish out the week's post or something or someone had her distracted. The 27th is also a day where we see the video of Shanann mentioning Miller's arms. I'm sure it was possibly an inside joke of some sort within the group about him like getting them from Walmart or something like that. Um, and looked at, you know, if you look at it as a whole over the course of these two months, it's exactly why people ask questions and why, you know, why people have been asking why not release Nico's paternity results. No doubt. Um, again, it's not, it's really none of our business as far as like if the family wants to keep it private, then that's obviously they have that right. Um, However, it's my thought that if those alive and involved wanted to really get the spotlight off of them and for this angle of the narrative to go away, then why in the world not release the results and just allow it to settle it for once and for all and then that whole issue can go away. And, I mean, the reality is is that marriage, marriage is difficult enough on its own, like, than to be having rumors flying around out there that you were the father of your deceased, you know, friend's baby. Um, just my thoughts, but, you know, let's just move on. The 28th makes for a post about kindness, and this is the big day where she receives her award, you know, like the frame with her photo in it for the magazine feature. Again, this is probably the peak of her Thrive career, and Chris Watts wasn't able to be there. There's a video out there of Shanann with her crew dancing around and singing a classic song by Journey. Followed up on the 29th, there's a photo of Atkinson curling Shanann's hair. It's a simple photo of friendship. She does mention that she's quote-unquote going to need, need Nicole to move in when they get back to Colorado. End quote. I do believe this is a little girl talk joke, but it wouldn't be the first time anyone ever moved in with the Watts. This is the last day of Thrive of Palooza, and in this video at the convention of Shanann, she sounds either tired or bothered. She later goes on to post that your vibe attracts your tribe. April 30th, Shanann posts a statement where she is missing the girls and praises Chris for staying home and taking such great care of them. She calls him the best dad. This is also the day she posts about eating a cupcake-flavored, quote-unquote, wedding cake and celebrates 14 years of friendship with Christina. She shares she found some pink matching flip-flops for the girls as well. So, I don't know if you're picking up on this, but these little subtle hints about married, um, she tends to do this, and I don't, I don't think it was naively posted. I think she she was putting stuff out there, just breadcrumbs, so that if someone was actually questioning whether or not they were happily married, she was letting, you know, letting it be known that, that yes, she was happily married. 
let's see. So now we're up to May 1st. She's at the airport and about to return to Colorado. May 2nd, she begins to post photos from the New Orleans trip. It very well could just be the filter, however, her eyes appear glossy as if she had been teary-eyed. This is just speculation based on my own observation of the photo. Shoot, sometimes my own eyes look like that if someone walks by me with too much perfume on. <laughs> I mean, I do try to keep my, you know, keep in context, keep in mind the context of the timeline when looking at these photos. This is her returning after probably the height of her career was celebrated without her husband, and now when she returns home, he appears less than thrilled to be in the Thrive videos. May 3rd, she has a tasting at the house with her friends. She appears much happier, and it's even stated in this video that Chris came back from the gym. So, I mean, several of us have been saying that Chris must have met Kessinger earlier and possibly at the gym, and in this video of the taste testing, she actually mentions it. So, I mean, is this somewhere that Kessinger used to work out and they were already communicating at that point? Um, you know, primarily most of their communication is around fitness and macros and stuff like that. So, that part would not surprise me at all. May 3rd, Shanine mentions in a post where Chris is getting in shape for the San Diego trip, doing squats, etc. May 4th is another big day for her with Lavelle as they tagged her personally to congratulate her on her achievement. She also had a Fab Fit, fab fit Fun box. <laughs> I can say that over and over a few times. Um, that was delivered or ordered. She shares her Thrive Story video and Atkinson comes over. This is a cute little video where you can hear just Dieter going nuts, which gives rise to... Dieter being locked up or being stored away somewhere when the detectives first arrived on the scene because you could not hear Dieter at all. Meanwhile, the moment someone walked up to the door when Shanann was sitting in the kitchen, Dieter went absolutely berserk. May 5th is a turnaround day in my opinion. This is the beginning of Shanann's attempts to let whomever is crossing boundaries know that they need to back off and that she's not afraid. Again, sure, these posts may mean absolutely nothing on their own, but knowing what was happening behind the scenes shines a bit of a different light. Also, on this day, she updates her profile photo with the lupus awareness frame. It's also Dieter's birthday. You guys, this all progresses up to that afternoon or evening when Shanian makes her purple shirt video. Call me crazy all day, but when you've been through a marriage with someone cheating, you just know. At this point, I believe she knows that the problem that existed in the beginning of the year, remember back in March, is not going away. Although I will say based on records, I do believe Chris tried to get away from Kessinger numerous times, yet she persisted. This is also the same day that she posts after the purple video, purple shirt video, she posts a quote that says, Be happy for each other, even if it's not for you. You know, I see Shanann being this empathetic and sympathetic person. Um, because you, you pick up on that in, in all of her videos. No matter if you like or agree with Thrive or not. Like, you can tell she she connects with her customers emotionally. And, you know, when I read this quote, it just really... I wouldn't put it past her, you know, having the heart. I'm not saying that she's like a saint by any means, but, you know, Chris could have easily made this conversation go something to the effect of, you know, this girl's just, she's just, you know, trying to find a good guy. Like, that's all. And it's not really anything. Like, he could have still been trying to play it off. And I could see Shanann saying, you know, like, hey, like, I know it sucks that you can't, like, I mean, obviously can't have my husband, but... You know, just be happy for each other, even if it's not your turn. You know, um, being single, you know, for 13 years, I, I had, you know, people would ask me all the time. Married, why are you not, you know, in a relationship? Well, my response was, it's just not my time. And so, you know, this could just be one of those personal um, 
connections where it's like, hey, I read something and I, it resonates with me because I've, I've lived that and I've been through that. But I can also see this as Chris trying to just buffer the situation and be like, no, nah, it wasn't anything. She's just a, you know, she's just a friend. She just keeps dating all these losers, whatever. And then this post comes up. So moving on, May 6th. This begins a stream of posts that if you've ever cried and tried to hide it behind makeup or a filter, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. You'll see many photos and videos where Shanian is posting and there's a pain in her eyes that you can see. Um, and again, you may have only had to have endured or been through that heartbreak or that uneasiness, um, that unsettled feeling of just knowing that something was not right for an extended period of time, it takes over your face um, and you can see it. it. It physically changes you. So keeping that in mind, May 7th, Shanian posts a picture of Chris mowing the front lawn captioned, he loves me. So again, she's outwardly projecting and, and producing these images and posts where she is making it known that her husband, you know, is there for her and loves her. May 8th, Shanian makes a post about, quote-unquote, my babies and wonders what three would be like. This goes hand-in-hand hand with my opinion that the purple shirt video followed yet another emotional conversation about an outsider and the importance of saving their marriage, if for nothing else, than for the girls. As mentioned earlier, Chris's idea about another baby, quote-unquote, fixing things, this would make sense why after that emotional conversation that she would start pondering baby number three. Something I did find interesting here was in the comments, Sandy only comments with awesome. It doesn't exactly scream, woohoo, another grandbaby, but then again, let's not read too much into it. When asked if she's expecting, Shanian comments back, thinking about it, but then this wouldn't be the first conversation about a baby. Remember back in the interview with the attorney at the Hibachi Grill in March of 2018? She mentioned potentially having another baby because Chris wants a boy. The lawyer even questioned why she would want to get pregnant if she's pondering a divorce. If we keep in mind Chris's mindset on how to save the relationship, then this makes sense in March and it makes sense again in May. Both times when the parasite shows up. It is interesting to note that later, when Shanann posts Bella doing tricep dips, Chris is sure to stay far out of the view of the camera. May 9th, Shanann posts about the car bonus with a photo of her and her Lexus. She also posts the purple shirt video and photo where she and Chris both appear to have been crying. This emotional conversation, in my opinion, is the day that the talk about having a third baby comes up, giving Chris's idea on how to salvage a relationship. They both appear to look like they've been crying. We know by way of the video that Chris was home with Shanian and the girls that day. This is the day when Shanian is, in my opinion, speaks much more directly to someone on a publicly posted live video. She mentions in this video that she will fight for her kids and her husband. I've shared this video before, but if you have time, I encourage you to go and listen to the full, unedited version of this video. Listen closely and you will hear the giggle I referred to in an earlier video. Then the giggle from Shanian sounds much like the Kessinger, the one that Kessinger attempted to imitate or mock in the voicemails that she leaves Chris. Either way, it's a disturbing and the disdain that she has for Shanian is audible in Kessinger's voice during the interviews. Shanian hits on key topics like family, husband, judging what others do, etc. I truly believe this was her outward way of processing what was happening within her family at this time. I will add my question if on this day, a text message between Chris and Kessinger was intercepted by Shanian. So basically, when she makes this purple shirt video, as I call it, um, you know, it's just as if she and Chris are at home that day with the kids, and, you know, I wonder if she intercepted a call or a text message with Kessinger, 
and it just sparked a whole nother emotional conversation and you know if you've ever been in a cycle with someone within a relationship you know exactly what I'm talking about. May 10th, Shanann posts her lupus awareness post. By May 12th, she's baking and cooking with Chris. Mother's Day um, post that she makes. May 13th, Mother's Day post with Cece throwing a tantrum. It's a little video. It's, it's cute. Um, May 14th, she's out running errands, showing off her Thrive Patch. Cece has, you know, had a bout with allergies and Shanann appears to look tired. She does mention baby fever in this post as well. And then to me, this is around the time when things start to amp back up. So, May 16th is a rise and thrive. Shanann posts a quote, stop doubting yourself meme. Um, and she makes a post stating, wake up and choose better. This is also Chris's birthday. And she even posted a second post, I guess, like from the girls, wishing him a happy birthday. May 17th, the biggest thing about this day, in my opinion, is that Shanian posts a video where Chris is wearing the Plays With Blocks t-shirt that we also see Kessinger wearing in photos released from Discovery. May 18th is an inspired post. Um, it's a screenshot. I'll try to get that up there for you guys. Um, May 19th, she appears to be refreshed in a great, in a great mood, and she's hosting a tapas party at her home. Now, here's an interesting little tidbit that came about and that's May 20th. Shanann posts about pro bars and makes sure to have her ring displayed. This is also the same day where they are grilling on the back porch and Shanann mentions them quote-unquote meal prepping. This is also the day when Shanann makes a post that I have questioned more than hardly any others. I'll be straight up with you. I do not doubt for a second this is wholeheartedly a battle between which woman could give this man the best and most accurate support or advice for his weight loss. In my opinion, Shanann was excited to join this group, no doubt for personal improvement, but also to connect with her husband. It's also a great networking opportunity. But guess who else could have very likely been a member of this group? I'd personally like more details, like who created this group? Who were the members? What apps did they use for tracking? What were this person's credentials? Did they ever meet in person? I mention it as a challenge between Shanann and Kessinger because Kessinger doesn't hide her disapproval for the supplements that Shanann sold. Kessinger also is following a meal plan very similar to a bodybuilder or fitness competitor. My Fitness Pal is a very popular app among fitness athletes. It's a world you have to be in to understand. I, for one, became a bikini fitness pro um, about eight years ago I now judge fitness competitions and so a lot of you know um, feedback that we give um, athletes as far as like at, you know once they finish their competition if they need to dial things in or, or be more conditioned you know one of the things we talk about is my fitness pal and how to accurately track your macros and things like that which again is what makes me think that this begins an energetic countdown to North Carolina. She also posts, once you have control of your mind, anything is possible. This, in my opinion, could be an indicator that there was yet another conversation that took place. She was either looking forward to North Carolina to break away from Colorado or trying, to, trying her best to remain positive about a very confusing day-to-day -day interaction with her husband. Planning a trip is a great way to distract yourself. She also makes a post about, quote-unquote, do not chase people, end quote. June 1st, something I noticed here is she starts to begin using, like, older photos to make her post. It's possible it could be a new one, but it appears to be the same makeup, hair, shirt as a few of her spunkier posts from earlier. She does a, quote-unquote, Flex Friday post for Thrive and is showing off her ring in several of these posts. June 4th, a Thrive post on the elliptical in the basement. And this is also a day when she spends some quality time with Bella at Target. Um, and we know that Chris, you know, Chris says that Shania never worked out. That she just, um, you know, she didn't like to go for runs with him or whatnot. She just, she would get on it and post it just to be posting it. 
and you know to each their own but I will also say that I found way back and it was like I guess her 2009 or 2010 post like Shanine was had used to used to have been a regular in the gym um, and then as she began to have her illnesses or her um, health challenges as she calls them um, she just didn't get in there as often but to have all that equipment down in the basement I don't know that I buy that she just never went down there um, so anyway June 5th some days change you forever I do need to look the screenshot up if I find it and can get it posted I will add it into this video this is also the day when we see the first emails between Kessinger and Watts at work Again, I do not believe that this was the first time they ever communicated. I think this is the first time that they ever were communicating at work. Um, June 6th, quote unquote, used to be a gym beast post. This is one of those posts where Shanann mentions that she used to be a gym beast. And it leads into another Thrive post. Um, it's during this you know, it's my opinion that during this time, it was morning sickness and early pregnancy. Basically, if you've ever been pregnant or you ever had a wife that's been pregnant, you know that, you know, that first trimester, it can drain you. Like, you just, you're tired. You don't really have all that spunkiness to, to do much of anything. And that's why I said back at the beginning, like, if she starts using older photos and posting them so that she's still having content, but she's not, um... You know, she may not be putting herself together every single day, and, and that's okay. I mean, if someone's got a problem with that, then whatever. Uh, June 8th, she her burn supplements arrive, and she seems to be pretty tickled about that. Um, June 9th, Chris sends Shanine a text regarding the supplement, and then she, you know, posts a screenshot of his message to her Facebook to promote it. Um, this happens quite a bit. And, I mean, hey, don't be hating on the screenshots, you know. June 10th. This is the pregnancy announcement we have all seen. They have been sprinkled throughout this video. But a little side note about this date is that Lacey Peterson found out she was pregnant with baby Connor on June 10th as well. According to her mother in the book for Lacey. Again, Shanann's brother has confirmed that Chris Watts was indeed tagged in these posts originally however when he deleted his account it was removed um this is important because as we recall kessinger continues to look both of them up on social media so in a very public post on both of their facebook pages the pregnancy was announced this also lines up with the reaction we see from chris you know with regarding the video i know we all differ in our opinions but it's my opinion he was not thrilled at all about her being pregnant, or at least not in the video. June 11th is the video announcement. Throughout the day, Shanann makes a few posts about baby Watts and mentions her first trimester. She also updates her profile picture to her, oops, you know, we did it again shirt, an announcement photo. The same day, she posts about another local mother warning about an ab attempted child abduction, and lastly, post stating that she's over it when talking about summer break so no doubt that you know the cat's out of the bag that they're expecting and so she's now being a little she's being more open about posting about the baby june 12th again something happened she posts something so happy as a baby announcement and then the next thing we see is her searching houses in north carolina this originally may not seem like anything, but if we keep in mind the conversation she had back in March with the attorney, it's now June, and it doesn't appear like anything is changing, besides now another baby. Something prompts her to look for houses in this area. She then makes a post about going to lunch with Bella and states diets are dumb. This is also the day the second batch of emails from Kessinger is exchanged between Kessinger and Watts. I do believe this is the one where they talk about being loyal and or she appreciates his honesty or something of that nature. June 13th, depression isn't sadness post. This is actually a great post. Um, if you have time to scroll through her page and read this one, it's totally worth it. 
um, I may try to link it and you know link it below so definitely make sure you check out the description box um, there isn't any doubt in my mind that she was wrestling with some type of depression even if it were circumstantial I think we all can agree that in this type of situation we would be all in our feelings June 14th this is the Facebook video where Bella mentions she guesses there are five babies in addition to this video, Shanann posted about getting a travel system for the new baby since it was on sale. And this is also the day that we see Bella singing the video, My Daddy is My Hero. June 15th. Chris Watts has been more talkative to strangers at work. She makes a post about being hangry but looks cheerful in her shirt that says, All I wanted was a back rub. So again, these are posts, you know, they're Thrive related, they're family related. Um, and she's still adoring her husband, you know. She's definitely making it known that she finds her husband attractive and she's proud of him. On June 16th, she posts about her sexy man, hubby, along with another pregnancy post and Thrive Promotions. So, I mean, it just seems to be a normal day of work and having the husband at home. June 17th, Shanann posts the Father's Day post where she implies that Chris was the one that talked her into having baby number three. She goes to the movies with Chris and Cece. She also posts Father's Day posts, you know, for her dad and for his dad. She did the same thing, of course, back on Mother's Day. Now, June 18th, it's my opinion that the Father's Day post must not have gone over well with someone because boy, did the mood shift the next day. This, in my opinion, could very well be a moment highlighting the real Chris as well. Think about it. How many people do you know that would rather keep an image and keep up the image than to have certain details out there? Shanann took some heat for being all over social media, but the same can be said for him withholding the same for their own selfish reasons. Take a moment and put the spotlight on Chris. He's able to scoot under the radar because Shanann is the one that's so outwardly social. Yet the Father's Day post lets out a little secret. She mentions it was his idea to have baby number three. That would no doubt ruffle some feathers with an outside observer looking in and the lies and betrayal would get extremely close to boiling over into light. I say that because June 18th continued. Shanann begins the San Diego countdown. She posts about her parents' wedding anniversary we see here again she mentions packing for both San Diego and the North Carolina trips. Now she's mentioned this a couple of times, so it's my opinion that this may be indicative that there's been some discord at home. Think about it, how many times have you battled something emotionally, whether it's depression, anxiety, a new pregnancy, postpartum, um, the exhaustion depletes you and some things you just don't get done. In addition to this, she also posts a photo of her and Atkinson at the nail salon. This is the same day she posts, if you've decided it's over, it's over, post on Facebook. Then she videos the first hailstorm. June 19th is the second round of the hailstorm. Chris misses the first ultrasound due to tornadoes. I don't know if he was actually near the tornadoes or if it was just an excuse not to attend the ultrasound. I mean, I know that there's photos and stuff like that, but, I mean, come on. You're out there in the middle of nowhere. You can see that tornado and whatever to each their own. Um, no matter how many tests you've taken or whether you want the pregnancy or not, that first ultrasound is something special. You get to lay eyes on your sweet little bundle that's growing, and it changes you. This may have been his first attempt at avoidance. However, he does at least text her loving messages and even mentions Bella's announcement that there were five. Again, it's easier to keep at bay and still seem emotionally invested from a distance. Can't really read, you know, someone's tone in a text message. It's rather sickening, especially knowing he was the one who wanted the baby. Shanann does post this conversation with Chris. <laughs> Again, screenshot queen, man. He may have tried to sneak that one in there, but she made sure she posted it. June 20th. This is simply another Thrive post where she's posting her list of things to do and her ring again is clearly visible. 
And keep in mind, guys, when I'm saying her ring is clearly visible, I'm not talking about the doorbell. I'm talking about that wedding ring of hers. You know, just really outwardly putting it out there that, hey, <laughs> we're not separated. He's not single. Like, we're married. I did put in my notes that, you know, this is a danger many of us don't see coming when social media is concerned. A seemingly innocent and sensible post is interpreted wrongly and only adds fuel to the fire. In my opinion, this is the time when the affair amps back up. It's possible San Diego was intended to be another recharge trip, but the emotional fear was already too far gone. Kessinger had her nails dug in Chris's back and Shanine was clinging to, you know, the hope for a life that their marriage could get through this and that sweet baby Nico would send them into an entirely different trajectory. June 21st. Shanian posts about getting CeCe's shot record to travel to North Carolina, but after further review of the comments, it appears it was potentially so she could travel with CeCe's EpiPen? I don't know. Some folks were saying it was never an issue, and I've not ever heard of someone needing medical records to do this. This does raise some questions to me regarding where Shanian's head may have been in those moments. She consulted a family attorney. Things haven't gotten better. Clearly, someone else was involved. Chris misses the ultrasound appointment, and it's so back and forth already. She may not have voiced it to others in efforts to protect her marriage, but in my opinion, and I'm sure those of you have ever been in a similar situation with marriage on the rocks, you just know. It's just my opinion that contrary to what some may state, Shanian was starting to kick into protective mode for her children, and this will explain some posts that she makes later on. I'm still indecisive if at this point she would have even mentioned this to anyone directly. She was posting just enough to get Chris's attention and to anyone else outside of the nuclear family information. It would have just been a talking point as it is in the comment section. So like, she definitely was putting enough out there that Chris and whoever he was involved with would have seen it for what it was. But anybody else reading it you know, they may have had some questions, but I don't think that it would have, like, sounded off any alarms for them. Shanann goes on to post about Baby Watts craving Panera, and she posts with her growing tiny human shirt. June 22nd. Shanann makes another post defending the trip they are about to take to San Diego, calling it a quote-unquote vacation and not a convention. Again, think of all the negatives we hear about MLMs today, and even to Kessinger's interview when she describes what Shanian does for work. This is a post where she really explains the perks of Thrive, almost like overselling it, and she posts a thank you to her dad for watching the girls. These San Diego trip posts and photos didn't really jump out to me. However, over the years, and with the knowledge of Kessinger's contact with Chris during this time, some things began to stand out. Her video where she records the hotel room is where it began for me. When you compare this video to those earlier videos within a year or two, Chris is much more standoffish in this video, careful to not appear too excited. It's my opinion Shanann already looks as if she shed some tears or has been holding some back. Her eyes are heavy, though she gives it her best to appear presentable. Let's watch. Our room. We have a really pretty room. Um, San Diego's gorgeous so far. Really, really pretty. They say it's called um, the June Gloom. So I'll show you guys. This is also the day she posts that success is my best revenge post. According to the comments, this is a reference or in reference to a call that they did that morning with Thrive. She then shares a post of herself by the pool. We notice upon review that she starts to defend her job more frequently. Now anyone that's spent a quick minute in true crime or MLM knows that the line of business is always being questioned and essentially attacked. We also know from Chris as well as his friend, Mark, that during this time he is still in communication with Kessinger. So if that trip backfired on her, she returned home to Chris not fully invested in their marriage, more distracted than ever. You know, by obviously or this mistress on the side, and not extremely supportive of Thrive at this point, 
then that trip home to North Carolina would quickly turn from an exciting trip to visit family to one of uncertainty. Let's continue moving forward with the timeline. June 23rd, she's posting photos of herself with her friends, very limited photos with Chris. When there are posts with Chris, you can tell it's definitely work-related. June 24th, my notes say, in quotes, it's what she doesn't say. When it comes to these posts, she's normally very descriptive in each aspect of the trip. You know, like when she's posting food or outfits or where they're doing or what they're doing, especially when she goes live. But for this trip, it's full of one to two word descriptions. She keeps everything very general. Imagine keeping your distance from someone. That's what appears to be happening, at least in the beginning. Keep in mind that these trips normally seem to bring them closer together. And in my opinion, the San Diego cruise seems to have been that moment that potentially brought them a little bit closer. I would love to hear the account of this trip from those closest to her. Not just those moments when they noticed he was being attentive to her, but from, you know, like start to finish. Shanann goes live on the San Diego cruise, as we've seen. If you haven't seen the video, it's definitely, you know, on the internet. I will say that it should be noted that when she posts the photos from the day, her descriptions are back. Day three in San Diego was amazing so far. Beautiful weather and amazing friends. Was this the day Chris's friend Mark met up with them? I mean, that's an interview worth looking into as well. Let's sidestep for a moment to explain my take on a photo that I posted with Miller and his mother. Please note, this is my opinion based on the posts and interviews I've read or seen. I will be the first to say that I wish her family would release the full results of Nico's paternity because, in my opinion, it will silence a lot of speculation surrounding this poor family. Marriage is hard enough, then you add the speculation that your husband is the alleged father of a deceased friend's baby and her family won't release the documents that would get the public off your back. These two families seem to have a very secure bond. I stumbled across the photo I have now posted to my page. I won't dox anyone or, or point you in the direction of, of who it is or where I found it. It's not very hard to figure it out, but um, upon my own discoveries, a recent visit, you know, I took a recent visit to their small town, and so I feel pretty comfortable sharing my opinion about this. Um, it's my opinion that these kids grew up throughout the years. Um, even his mother was close to Shanann. Now, when I say they grew up, um, Chris Miller and Shanann went to high school together. So, according to her post, Miller's mom appears to be a doting mother figure. Um, when you take into account the frigidity of the Watts towards Shanann, um, it's no wonder she gravitated towards Miller's mother. And let me be clear, I'm by no means saying that I understand the full relationship. However, I did grow up in a very small town, very small town. Uh, my family was and is still very close with my best guy friend's parents. Um, like, our families are just like, it's just like family. Um, his, you know, his mother and father are like another mother and fa father to me. Um... I mean, my my best guy friend, like, his house was the house where, like, everyone gathered. We all played in the yard. We all played football. Um, so, while I'm not saying I know or that I have any of the answers for the Millers uh, with regards to this case, I am saying that I understand having a neighborhood family that you're super close with throughout the years, and you love them like family. So, then you treat them, and you talk to them, and you include them as closely as you would family. Um, Shanann and Miller could have easily had more of like a brother-sister relationship as well. So setting that aside, or setting aside the speculation and drama, I do believe it's important to note that on this trip, Miller brought his mother. She did start thriving, and she even mentions that she felt like this trip gave her her life back. Both Chris Watts and Miller can be seen in some photos, and, and Miller's mother even 
quotes that they're taking care of the women, you know, at the pool. So maybe by the end of this trip, there was something that was reminiscent. You know, there was something that was helping to buffer the brewing situation between Chris and Shanann. Um, some photo, some photos are a bit too close for my taste and it has been brought to my attention like, um, you know, like their body language and things like that. Um, but not everyone has the same relationship boundaries that I have either. And I respect that as we all should. Um, I will say I was rewatching Cece's birthday video and do you know who I see? You can actually see Chris Miller's wife in the back she's holding uh, what appears to be her daughter and just something that stood out to me was apparently Chris Miller served in the military Shanann's first husband served in the military and I too have had a history with military being a military wife and I will tell you military wives do stick together when there is a close bond this could very well explain the bond that Shanann and Miller's wife had as well as the mutual relationship and friendship with Miller himself. Miller and Shania knew each other in high school, but those military roots run deep. And when I say that, I mean for Kessinger as well. Listen to the end of this interview with Kessinger with her father, where she's mentioning the safe house that she has in experience with the military. Even the detective mentions to Kessinger's father that he's been through this before. The fact that Kessinger was practically wiped off the web and is non-existent raises the question, what in the world was that girl mixed up in that she had already established a safe house on standby? I like a safe house in Denver that I can go to, that I have the go. keys to, that has that's nobody what we're, there that's what ever, we're for the next and it's all I weeks. have to do is check the mail, and there's no questions asked, and nobody knows where it is, and I'm not telling anybody, but it's like a really nice spot for me to like hide Go out, there. and I don't have any friends in that building. I mean, it's an apartment, but and it's And we like will safe. answer your phone calls, but the safe house is from- The safe Go, house go there. is the safe People house. People banging on her apartment well, door. When should I go there? When do you think all this is gonna start happening? I mean, it's kind of- I mean, might be just good for you to go there anyways for your sanity and stay away from this place that you had a connection to this man with and get your thoughts in order. It's so sad. That was my nest. That was like such a warm little place. That was your... Now, it's like I haven't even slept in my bed. I've just been sleeping on the couch with the dog. <laughs> I don't really want to do it. Things appear back on track. Shanann's posts are more exciting and descri descriptive. She's posting photos with Chris. Atkinson earns her car bonus. And so, I mean, it would be evident that the trip very well may have, you know, swung them back in the right direction. This takes us on to June 26th. She makes a post about food allergies and they fly back to Denver. She posts some photos from the San Diego trip as well as several Thrive posts. She mentions not ever flying with Cece again until she's 15. Now, keep in mind that by this time, Shanann is now in North Carolina with the girls, and Chris is free to do as he pleases. And he did just that. Shanann posts throughout the month of July about the baby, pregnancy, family, and Thrive. July 4th just hits differently for me. Maybe it's because of Frankie Jr.'s interview and the accounts for the rain that holiday. I will say Shanann looks radiant in the photo from the 4th of July. It's probably one of my favorite photos of her. She was safe and she was loved. This isn't making her out to be a saint. It's a personal observation that from March of 2018 all the way to July of 2018, the ebbs and flows of emotional abuse can be seen on her face as it is many women who live that life behind closed doors. At this point, I think we've all seen the messages between Chris and Shanann, and it brings us back full circle to August. June 27th through 28th, Shanann is online to work. She posts several Thrive posts. She's in North Carolina with her family, but she makes mention of the humidity, but is continuing to build her clientele in the small town. And guys, when I say it's a small town, I'll go over it in my, in my Aberdeen video, but it is a very small town. 
It does appear that she's trying to wrap up the month on a solid note with sales. This is a day where her ring is visible as well in her post. This is where her Facebook remains to this day. Other posts have been deleted, and it should be noted that Facebook posts posted after this one for the purposes of this video were found in older public posts related to this case. They were, you know, we had access to them before this story became like a Netflix documentary and things like that. June 27th, Chris messages Kessinger. Ugh, it's just disgusting to even say this, but here we go. So Chris messages Kessinger, in quotes, promise I'm all about loyalty, truthfulness, and being dedicated. He doesn't like to play games unless it's role play, insert eye roll. He goes on to say he will be there with ice cream, cookies, and lollipops. Sounds like a cheat meal night, end quote. Not sure if this is, is little girl giggle role playing with candy or a drug party, but it raises so many questions. So many questions. And I'm working another angle in another video for that. So there's more coming from this video. That's why it's taken so long to put it together. Let's see. June 29th at 7.34 p.m. Chris says to Kessinger, I'm still going to see you. It may not be as frequent as we would like, but he will, uh, he will make it happen. You think you're the only one addicted. He's hooked on her. And I put gag because it's just, it's difficult to read these messages knowing that um, this back and forth that we see, it's interesting because Shania does make no, or she does make a point to point out that he really was not trying to be in contact with her, with the kids. And then you can just see it with the color coordination of the notes, how it goes from blue to red, blue to red. And then you don't, you know, really get any purple back in there for a little bit. So anyway, moving on. Chris sends to Kessinger at 8.20 p.m. Sleeping without your warm body next to me isn't going to be fun tonight. Again, that whole six-week timeline of them, that's just BS in my opinion. June 30th, Kessinger sends a text message suggesting that they spend the night out of town at a Holiday Inn. She alludes to her friend supporting her, but that she went through something similar as a child. This is the text where Kessinger states that she's made up her mind and are we bad people. July 1st at 1.25 p.m., Chris tells Kessinger that being in her life is something he craves. Then at 9.23 p.m., Chris tells Kessinger to conserve her energy. July 4th at 6.53 p.m. Colorado time, Chris tells Kessinger that he has horrible service where he is and that it will take some time to download whatever photos it was that she sent him at that time. God only knows what those were. At 7.30 p.m., Chris mentions to Kessinger that he's having a protein shake and resisting the foods at the park. Good for him. At 10.30, Chris texts Kessinger that he's stuck in traffic, then lets her know that he pulled up to her place at 11.02. Meanwhile, July 4th, Shanann checked into Aberdeen Town Lake and the park, Parks and Recreation Park. Let's just take a quick moment to pause and listen to Frankie Jr.'s account for the 4th of July in North Carolina. July 6th, we see that Shanian checked into Brooklyn Pizza in Spring Lake, North Carolina. Take notice because you're going to start to see a bunch of red popping up in these notes. July 7th, 2018, Kessinger called Watts had a two-minute conversation, and per the discovery, this is the first phone call documented between the two of them. You really believe they went all summer without talking on the phone? July 9th at 11.09 a.m., Kessinger texts Chris that he's so considerate. July 14th, Kessinger and Watts went to the Mustang Museum in Boulder. This is also the day that Kessinger went over to the Watts home. She mentioned seeing photos of Shanann and the girls, which, kind of curious which photos that was, because she would have had to have been, I want to say it's Bella's room, where there were pictures of Shanann with Chris and the kids. 
because the picture seen in the living room, I do believe, is a picture of Christina Meacham and one of the girls. And then the back living room by the kitchen, there may be some smaller photos back there. But the only room where there's actually um, large enough photos to, to see, I do believe, is, is Bella's room. This is also the day where she freaked out while she was there and she stormed out of the house and sat in the driveway. Um, this is the moment when Chris mentions in his interview that he had to talk her through until she calmed down. Or in his words, talk her off of a cliff. It's this day where Kessinger informs Chris that she had accepted uh, but was stood up for two other dates. So this is where Kessinger starts mind playing with Chris. Like she's been on eHarmony. She's accepted to go on two other dates. She claims that they stood her up um, and just kind of playing with his head at this point. And that evening when they attempted to have sex, he isn't able to perform. Uh, no doubt this messed with his head, both of them apparently, and things didn't work for them that night. It's my opinion that this was a bit of a wake-up call for Chris that he might be on the verge of losing his family for someone who was still entertaining other people. Chris later states that this is around the time he started to think about the murders. I can't remember which confession he said that in. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I don't know that I believe that. I think that the concept that he had to have premeditated this or he had to have thought this out kept getting pushed onto him and so he was trying to pin, you know pick a pick and choose a, a point of when he started to think about it chris had his own storm brewing and it was about to collide head on with shenanigans chris has you know he has a decision to make at this moment is he going to work on his marriage or figure this thing out with kessinger this would be a question and a decision that would go back and forth countless times before the ultimate ending continuing July 14th at 9.58 in the morning, Kessinger called Watts. They had a five-minute conversation. At 15.37, Kessinger called Watts, had a five-minute conversation. At 16.02, Kessinger called Watts, had a 43-minute conversation. At 16.26 to 17.23, Kessinger is on the phone with Watts, and he mentioned, or he missed four calls from Shanann during this time. Now, I think this is even you know, something to note as well is that Kessinger called Watts, Kessinger called Watts, Kessinger called Watts. Like, clearly she's the one pursuing at this point because, I mean, you've got 9 a.m., uh, 3, like 3 p.m. Now, this is one that I haven't really heard spoken about. On July 16th, uh, Shanann checked into the camping world in North Carolina. Now, this is an interesting check-in, and it stands out to me because as a single mother with two children that went through a divorce with young children, um, this was a route that I decided to take when I was pursuing nursing school. So, I lived with my own five- and two-year-old sons in a camper on my parents' property until I graduated as a nurse. Um, and that's what brings me to one of the first questions I've had, and that is, you know, her parents have said that they had no idea that things were that bad. They had no idea. They didn't see this. You know, they didn't see. No one saw the murders coming. But that they didn't really see or have any indication. And they may not have because it was, you know, they lived 3,000 miles away. Um, but here she is back home. It's an extended stay over the summer. She's separated from her husband. I mean, like, not technically separated, but clearly he's not there with her. Um, you know, did she go here on her own, or was this part of a plan that Shanann and her family were discussing? Like, hey, if, you know, crap hits the fan, you and the girls can come stay here on the property. Like, we can put a camper out there for you guys, and, you know, until you get on your feet. It's what most families would do. It's what most southern families would typically do. Now, North Carolina is not exactly as southern as, like, the small towns that I grew up in. But having been, and that's why I really, really wanted to go visit Aberdeen. And I'm so glad that I did because I had such an insight now into that small town um, compared to what it's been blown up as, you know, for 
networking and things like that. Um, it would not have been out of the ordinary for her to have had this option and for her to have gone there and checked it out. Um, it just leads me to believe like, did that discussion come up at some point? And I'm going to say this, whether you're for her or not, there is 100% nothing wrong with it. If they did. Divorce doesn't discriminate, and both Chris and Shanann would have had to make decisions for themselves moving forward. It would make sense for her to open up to someone, especially her family, about the possibility possibility, excuse me, of having to move closer to family to have help with the kids. We see her do this with some of her friends via text. So, I mean, it's clear uh, that it's on both sides. And it's also clear that Chris didn't have a problem telling his parents what was going on. We will hear this in Ronnie's own words. July 16th, Shanann checks into Bojangles in Hope Mills, North Carolina. July 17th, she checks into Vito's Pizzeria in Southern Pines, North Carolina. July 17th, at 2.20 p.m., Chris Watts texts Kessinger, I hope it's 2.30, you need some rest. Whatever that's about. I have no idea. July 21st, Shanann checks in to Kickback Jacks in Southern Pines, North Carolina. And then we get into some red. July 21st, Watson Kessinger went to Bandemir and Rooftop Tavern, Tavern in Morrison. July 24th at 1317, Kessinger Googled, Man I'm having an affair with says he will leave his wife. July 25th, at 1635, Shanann called Chris, and during this conversation, Kessinger left the voicemail with a creepy giggle. Immediately after ending this phone call with Shanann, he calls Kessinger back, and they have a 14-minute conversation. July 26th, at 530 in the morning, Kessinger called Watts for a three-minute conversation. Y'all, that's just absolutely crazy. Nobody better be calling me at 530 in the morning for a three-minute conversation. Anywho, July 26th, Lamore Nails. Shanann checks into what seems to be one of her favorite nail salons. Um, she posts a photo of her new manicure, and of course, she's proudly displaying her wedding ring. July 26th at 10.26 a.m. Colorado time, Chris texts Kessinger stating she deserved a raise. July 28th, Kessinger and Watts visit and stay at the sand dunes overnight. July 30th at 1644 Kessinger called Watts, left a voicemail with another creepy giggle. July 31st, Chris arrives at the airport in North Carolina. Most of us have seen this video at this point. The girl set off the alarms in the airport running up to him. And that brings us to August. August 1st, Shanann, Chris, and the girl stay overnight with her parents and then drive to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. This is the girl's first time ever to see the ocean. August 2nd, they visit the pier and do some of the fun attractions that are age appropriate for the kids. This is where we see the girls jumping and taking photos. It should be noted that by this time, Shanann is certainly suspicious of Chris and she isn't feeling well. I know many speculate if in fact he gave her something that made her sick, but this woman was in emotional hell at this point. The depression and anxiety from the circumstances would have made anyone feel sick, especially being pregnant. August 3rd, at 7.19 p.m., Shanann texts Addie, asking how she's doing. She responds with Chris is bothered by his parents' shit and that she's paying for it. Shanann then mentions that she needs a stiff drink, but frankly, who could blame her? I probably want one, too. Chris is telling Shanann at this point that it's his dad, the issues with his dad that's bothering him. August 4th at 7.48, Addie asks why she's paying for it, and Shanann responds that it's just too much to text. Shanann shares with Addie a long message that she wrote to Chris. During the afternoon, Shanann mentions that she's been alone for two hours and has no idea where Chris is. This is when Shanann makes note of Chris changing his phone's wallpaper as well. Also, on August 4th, after midnight, so like 12.45 in the morning, 
um, Kessinger searches over two hours for wedding dresses. And at 1410, Kessinger searched both Chris and Shanann's Facebook accounts. So again, here we are, August 4th of 2018. Kessinger searches both Chris and Shanann's Facebook accounts. You tell me that this woman did not know that Shanann was pregnant. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. She is straight up the devil and the devil is a lie. August 6th at 9.51 in the morning, Shanann asked Addie what time is she getting into Arizona. They confirmed their flight details and discussed what's going on with each of them regarding family. Shanann mentions Chris is taking his parents' side and that she needs a glass of wine. They continue to work with Thrive until 9.30 p.m. that evening. I put it in blue because Chris is spending time with his parents and writes the now infamous note where he states that if anything happens to him or the girls to look into his wife. He leaves this note with Watts in North Carolina. August 7th at 7.15 in the morning, Shanann texts Addie stating that Chris told her he was scared to death of having another baby, that he's happy with just Bella and Celeste and doesn't want another baby. Shanann expressed to Addie that Chris has changed and that she doesn't know who he is. Says he hasn't touched her all week and only answers questions when he's spoken to. It's clear she is distraught over this. She states he's been distant ever since she left. By this point, the Watts apologized to Chris about missing Cece's birthday party, but also stated that Pershney and that they were scared of her. She states Chris was totally on board with the North Carolina trip and her leaving. She states they've never had a problem like this and that it's total left field. Shanann mentions he's not once asked about how she feels in the most heartbreaking text that I've read was, what if he really doesn't love me anymore? Addie reassures her, and Shanann mentions that the following day is eight years that they started dating. The emotional struggle between Chris and Shanann with secrets and family issues mixed with the parasite that wouldn't back off really began to shift back and forth once they removed themselves away from family and arrived back in Colorado in August. August 8th. This is in blue, so this is from Chris. But at, eight, at 5.52 on August 8th, North Carolina time, Josh sends Chris a text and asks if he's excited about the ultrasound. At 7.12, Chris replies that it's at 7 p.m. and that he was excited. Chris stated he was ho secretly hoping it was a boy. Now, he offered up that. It wasn't even like someone asked him. He offered that. At 9.44 a.m. North Carolina time, Chris stated that Shanann had been fussing at him about not wanting to eat certain foods. Now, this just kind of goes back to small, like, you know, husband and wife bickering kind of stuff. Don't think much of it, right? Not, at least not on its own. At 6.02 p.m., Josh messages Chris about waiting patiently, and Chris tells him that the envelope is sealed until the big reveal. So, from the accounts of Chris, it and especially reading that between him and Josh, I mean, it sounds like he's looking forward to the ultrasound and he's, you know, excited. Also, on August 8th, at 19.25, so 7.25 p.m., Kessinger searches marrying your mistress. It should be noted that this would be 5.25 p.m. North Carolina time, and Kessinger is searching about marriage, yet this is also the first day that Chris sees their baby. I do believe, and this may be, I'll have to confirm this, but I do believe that the ultrasound was actually in, done in Colorado, I believe. I believe they got back, um, it had to have been the 8th. I'll double check that and drop it in the description just to clarify. Um, August 8th at 10.40 p.m., Shanann's friend Taylor text Shanann and ask about the gender reveal party and states that she was told by Nikki that she needed to cancel the party. Shanann replies to her with no, can I call you tomorrow? Chris said we aren't compatible anymore. Shanann goes on to say that he refused to hug me, said he thought another baby would fix his feelings and that he refuses couples counseling. When asked what the hell happened, Shanann's response to her friends was that Chris says he has had plenty of time to think. Additionally, this evening, she keeps Addie in the loop and shares a similar text. You know, she sends very similar texts between a couple of friends. 
So that was the night or the day. It started out excited about the ultrasound and then shifted somehow into Kessinger thinking that she was looking up marrying your mistress to suddenly he was extremely cold and distant during the ultrasound and now they're canceling the gender reveal and Shanann is a, again, you know, just an emotional, she's in emotional hell. August 9th, 4.52 a.m. Shanann states that Chris did attend the 4D ultrasound, but was very cold towards her. So he was excited to go, yet he's cold? This makes sense if the parasite wasn't leaving him alone. Too bad we don't have those texts where, you know, she was saying, spend time with your wife, but here's some nude pictures. Shanann goes on to state that Chris says he won't go sit on a damn couch and tell someone what he just told her. It appears this... It appears in this text that she had already begun looking for counselors in the area. The messages continue to include Shanann stating that baby Nico deserved for him to go and that she thought they were in love because they were so intimate before she left. And this is where, this is where Ted Bundy's description of pornography is spot on. Um, I know we don't talk about this very much on the channel, but the thing with pornography is that it establishes a disconnection from your emotions and the physical fulfillment. And so Chris may have been having more sex with Shanann before she left because he was emotionally charged and turned on by Kessinger. So an affair and pornography, um, especially an affair where the emotional attachment is not there, um, it's almost like real life pornography. And so, um, you know, they talk about the high that comes off of an affair being equal to that of, you know, I want to say meth. And, um, so anyway, it's just basically like, you know, we don't know how their interactions were like, uh, during the time that Anna Darko, nor do we know, um, the continued climate within their home, but it's clear per phone data that Chris had not been faithful and he was seemingly confused on what or how it felt to truly be in love. I do believe this is why he googled, how do you know if you're in love? He had such an emotional disconnect with the affair that he truly couldn't decipher if he loved Kessinger or Shanann. I do believe he now realizes that the dif- you know, he does realize now what the difference was. Or oh Lord, we can at least hope so. There are quite a bit of conversations between Addie and Shanann that can be found in the discovery. I don't really want to go through too many of those. Um, Addie does ask if Shanann has looked through his phone. And this is also the day when Shanann mentions that she didn't think Chris had it in him to have another girl. She then discovers that he's deleting texts with his dad. And I'd really like to see what that content was that was deleted between the two of them. Especially with Kessinger looking up Ronnie Watts. Um, as you read the text between her and Addie, you can feel the emotions. She's racking her brain on what to do. He tells her opposites attract, but he's not feeling it with her anymore. Then according to Shanann, Chris is telling her it's all him and nothing that she's done. She asks if he wants a divorce and his response is not like tomorrow. I mean, this is literally that back and forth that I was talking about. She debates on calling his mom to make amends, you know, over the whole nutgate thing. She's seen expressing her concerns to Addie and says even though she's agreed to apologize that he still said that she put a dagger between him and his dad. And, you know, you see Shanann go back and forth between, like, she's hurting, she's sad, and then she gets pissed off, and then she's hurting, and it's just, it's a cycle. Um, it's pretty pathetic in my opinion, but Lord knows it happens more than you know. Shanann states that she thinks he slept in the basement last night. And as many women do, Shanann attempts to pull herself out of the slump and focus on being around the positive energy of friends in the coming days. We should note that August 9th was also the day the doll photo was posted. I know there's some controversy around that, um, whether or not Shanann posted it herself or, you know, how that came about. I, I think there's so much that could be said about that on that photo as well. Um, August 9th continued. At 3.01 p.m., Shanann states that she's going with the flow and that he's acting more like himself. So again, something changed. He's still distant, but tonight 
has been the best talk and says he's out for a run. Now, his out for runs, I'd be interested to know, you know, if he was meeting up with someone. In my opinion, Shanine and Chris had a discussion about the reality of their debt and what they needed to do to get out from under it and move forward not only with Nico but with their home. The housing market was booming, so selling wasn't going to be an issue. This is evident in the text messages between Shanine and and Ann Meadows, excuse me. Ann Meadows is their realtor to help them purchase their first home at Saratoga. At 4.28 p.m., Shanann states one minute he's willing to go away, and 30 minutes later, he deletes his Facebook account. So again, we're back at this. It's like you have a few good hours, and then you're back on the roller coaster. And Shanann texts her friend by 6.20 p.m., asking her friend if she could watch the girls. She explains that she and Chris are going to try to take a trip together on the 17th. That brings us up to August 10th. Shanann mentions it's been a long 11 days without sleep. She's too tired to go out with the crew. It appears that this time she stays in her room. Her friend asks if things are getting any better and she says things are going in the right direction. It's also on this day that Shanann exchanges messages with Ann Meadows, their realtor, and discusses potentially moving to Brighton. After studying this case and evidence, we have... I can't help but wonder if the ninth leading into the tenth was a very emotional day of conversation yet again. Chris had been cold during the ultrasound. It's noted that Shania noticed it. Chris states, she said, you'll never see the kids again prior to leaving for Arizona. And then they are able to reach a compromise about the house. It's hard to pinpoint where this back and forth landed on the day that she left. But looking forward into the timeline, we see the behavior of a woman about to lose her love interest pulling out all the stops, including talks of a threesome to woo the married man. Was Chris turning back and the mistress decided to up the ante? Let's continue. August 10th from Chris. At 6.51 a.m., Josh congratulates Chris via text on the baby being a boy. At 11.20 p.m., Watts mentioned it's a good thing Kessinger left early because the game didn't end until 10.20. That was the message that he sent to Kessinger. August 11th. At 9.30 in the morning, Kessinger spent 45 minutes searching how to prepare for anal sex in the anal sex guide, which progressed to searches for pornography. And it's noted in the discovery that clearly this was not her first time visiting any of these sites. Um, She also searches about threesomes, and I won't even go into the rest of the stuff. It's a bit much. August 11th at 12.30, a little after midnight, Uh, Chris texts Kessinger that he hopes she had a great night and states that he misses her. So this makes me question whether or not this whole sex capade stuff is what happened. You know, like, is this proof that Kessinger stayed the night at the Watts house at 2825 Saratoga Trail? Would this explain finding the eye mask on the bed in the basement? It was left over from their sex capades. What are your thoughts? Keeping in mind she could enter the house with the privacy of Shanann's car in the garage and via the garage door entrance without being seen by neighbors. August 12th at 3.14 p.m., Chris texts Kessinger practically setting up her alibi of being with her family at the IMAX. He does give her another update at 4.07 p.m. from the birthday party. What exactly was she doing during this time? Was the IMAX confirmed? If so, where's the proof in the discovery? I mean, where's your ticket stub? Where's your bank statement? Where's something showing that you were at the freaking IMAX? Zero documentation of Kessinger's whereabouts until the morning of the 13th. Kessinger and Watts have their 111-minute phone call that miraculously neither of them can remember what was discussed. And that brings us to August 13th. We know that Shanann arrives home And we've seen the video of her coming up to her house. At 6.16 in the morning, Kessinger pings in Frederick when she calls Jim. Keep in mind, the last time she pings here, she placed herself at 2825 Saratoga Trail and inside the house. Chris has also already gone to work by this time. So why would she be there? At 2.44 p.m., Chris text Kessinger oh my god 
they, that is absolutely ridiculous. They would freak out. This text message, I do believe, is sent while he is watching the footage um, at Nate's house. At 17.01, Kessinger called twice. Both went unanswered and were deleted from her phone. At 23.09, Kessinger called Watts and held a 51-minute conversation. Deleted this again from her phone. This is also the day Kessinger tells Watts to pawn Shanann's wedding ring. August 14th, this is a little after midnight, it's like two minutes after midnight, she searches for Shanann Watts. She searches her name for hours. At 1.58, law enforcement is trying to contact Chris and appears to be playing phone tag as mentioned in the discovery, and it can be seen on the body cam video as well. At 2.05 in the morning, Chris calls the detective from his work phone. Meanwhile, we see that Kessinger is connected to his personal phone for 10 minutes. At 2.07, so keep in mind, 2.05, Chris connects with his work phone and is on the phone for a while with law enforcement. At 2.07 a.m., Watts called Kessinger. It was unanswered, and Kessinger called him right back, and they have a 10-minute conversation. So she turns right around and calls him back, and that would put her little behind on the phone, probably on speaker, listening in when Chris is talking to detectives. At 1700, Kessinger searched topics um, stating, can cops trace text messages? How long do companies keep text messages? Difference between text content and text message details? And every single one of these searches were deleted. At 1821, Kessinger searched news accounts for Shanann's incident. Again, she deletes it. Kessinger confirms with law enforcement that she has, in fact, deleted her communications with Chris as of 8-14-2018. She also gets a new phone on this day. At 8.08 p.m., Chris sits down with law enforcement for his first interview. This is the interview where Coder really hammers into Chris about having an affair. August 15, 2018, Chris sits down with Agent Tammy Lee and takes the polygraph test. This is also the same day that Kessinger meets with, with detectives in Arvada Park. This is the first interview where Shanann and the girls have not been found and their demise is unknown. August 16, 2018, Kessinger meets with her dad and agents Kobach and Martinez. We do have the video for that. August 17, 2018 is the third interview with Kessinger. Um, this is a phone interview. And I do believe we have another um, another interview where we have video of her as well. Um, August 19th, Kessinger searched for Amber Fry's net worth and book, Amber Fry's book deal. And did people hate Amber Fry? So that will wrap up the timeline. So as far as the timeline goes, that's where I'm going to pause for this video. I will surely continue to build on this and add to it, but for the sake of this topic, I wanted to give you a descriptive overall analysis of the timeline leading up to the murders. Now that we've worked our way back to the beginning, I'll share one of my top theories of what I believe actually happened when Shanann arrived home. Following the back and forth of the text messages, it's my opinion that Chris expected Shanann to just throw him out or divorce him. Knowing what she knew, and yet she began fighting even harder for their marriage. Writing the letter, buying the book, booking the Aspen trip. I believe this prompted him to pull away from Kessinger a little bit more. You know, again, here he's probably thinking, good God, you already know about, I've had this girlfriend. And, you know, we've got all this stuff going on, and surely she's going to leave me. And just, you know, if Shanann leaves, then maybe it's easier for him. I don't know. But when that doesn't happen, it creates a problem for Kessinger. I believe this prompted him to pull away from her, and the pendulum kept swinging rapidly, sometimes every 30 minutes from Shanann and, so and his marriage waiting for. back to Kessinger. It's the one theory that best explains how others could have been involved, yet no charges have been made. I've mentioned it earlier in this series, but let's take a look at it. let's take a look at it and what possibly could have happened that morning that led to this tragedy. 
As mentioned previously, some discord began to show itself outwardly back in March of 2018. We know per the discovery that clearly Kessinger and one of the Watts had crossed paths with in some way, shape, or form. Keeping in mind, Kessinger once had ties in North Carolina as well as both Chris and Shanann. Then they conveniently crossed paths again 2,000 miles across the country later in 2017, according to Kessinger's internet search history and the discovery. Kessinger appears interested in cars, etc. Could Kessinger have crossed paths in North Carolina with either of them and with the power of social media made the local connection once in Colorado? In part two, I discuss the significance of the different type of, types of stalking. Sometimes all it takes is a chance encounter for an obsession to begin. Add that public accessibility of social media and it opens the doors and windows for unwanted attention and no doubt fuels the obsession lurking in the background until it can no, no longer be contained and then they show up in person. By March 2018, Shanann had already considered divorce enough to warrant a chance conversation with an attorney over a hibachi dinner. Keep in mind, after eight years of being together, what, you know, what would cause that to be the topic of discussion? We must keep in mind that she was a real human being with real emotions. She does make it abundantly clear via text with her friends that if indeed he was cheating, she would, she would divorce him. You don't discuss specifics such as child custody in court, in divorce court, regarding the state of Colorado if you haven't had a reason to consider divorce. That's just my opinion, but I think many would agree. Something prompted this conversation. They had already dealt with the bankruptcy without divorcing, had some babies, managed to, you know, do okay with that, dealt with each other's families for almost eight years without divorcing, and now in March... She's fishing for information regarding divorce in Colorado with children. We heard in Hidden Motives Part 1, Mr. Rusek mentions in a police interview that the thought crossed his mind regarding the motive. That if Chris thought to himself that with Shanann gone, that the kids would go to her parents and he would still lose them. You know, maybe that would be a potential motive. Yet, even with his daughter no longer here, he still couldn't understand him killing the kids. I believe many still feel the same way. We also hear in the body cam footage when Chris responds to Officer Coonrod's question about her possibly being with her parents. He says, yeah, that's not happening. So alone, one thought may mean nothing, but when you couple it with his response in the very beginning, the motive begins to become a little more conceivable. According to Mr. Rusek, Shanine originally was coming out to North Carolina for a couple of weeks and then later extended it to six weeks. In a text between Shanann and Chris, she tells him that she doesn't want to leave North Carolina like this. When the, we then learn, excuse me, through interviews that co with coworkers of Mrs. Rusek that it was even mentioned that there was talk of a separation prior to them leaving North Carolina. Small town gossip, or had Shanann been there long enough for the small truths to begin to be revealed? I think it is a great time to address both families and their actions of what happened or excuse me, their reactions to what happened both in the early hours and then later on as the years have gone by. No doubt both families were caught off guard by the murders. I don't believe either of them saw how horrible it would become. Both families naturally wanted to protect their child, in my opinion, knowing that a divorce very well was on the horizon. Thus, one too many Lifetime movies prompted the note that was left behind in North Carolina at the Watts home. The note, in my opinion, wasn't left as a result of a plan to murder anyone. Rather, it was an alert, if you will, that in the event that anything went sideways, then it would implicate Shanann. It's my opinion that's when that whether Chris shared his concerns or ideas with both of his parents or just his father. Ronnie mentions in his interview with police prior to Chris confessing that there had been trouble and things weren't going well. It's my opinion that both Cindy and Ronnie at the very least suspected an emotional affair, but didn't realize that it was in fact much more than just a fling. It's evident when Ronnie joins Chris in the interrogation room that he's aware of the mistress, like that was no surprise to him. 
um, didn't, didn't really seem to phase him at all. Nor did the original narrative. Remember, originally Chris confessed that Shanine killed the kids and then he killed her. He has since recanted his statement. However, something he does say that he's never taken back was, in quote, she wasn't supposed to be there. And why did she hit my kid? And I don't want to protect her. Was there trouble in paradise? Yes. Was there a plan to separate or get a divorce? I believe so. Was money enough for the motive? In my opinion, not in this case. Neither one of them were really driven or didn't really appear to be that phased by it. The only one who seemed genuinely to have an issue with their spending and lifestyle was Kessinger. This is her as she gives her opinion of their home, furnishings, etc. You know, and we discussed that back in part four. So if you haven't uh, taken a moment to go look at that, check that one out for sure. The only way that these murders occurred in the manner that they did without any additional charges being made it's my opinion that others were involved in a plan to take the girls to a safe place until Chris and Shanian could have a conversation to discuss things. I do not want to merely speculate as to what happened when Shanian crossed the threshold of the door at home that night. However, because of the blue light that shines brightly, I do believe Chris was downstairs watching TV or else he had left the TV on. The remote can be seen placed on the island in the kitchen via the body cam footage. The thrive patch on the wall of the shower gives me reason to believe that she took a shower or possibly Chris took one. Chris not wanting to quote unquote protect her and she shouldn't be there are all comments that point to someone other than Shanian being present at the home that morning. The phone ping as well as Kessinger's own interviews prove this nugget of information to be true. Who does she call that happened to be in town that weekend? Jim. According to the U.S. Department of Justice Peer Review Journal, titled Homicides of Children and Youth, Children 6 Years Old and Under, are more likely killed by a female than a male. Sadly, homicide is... Homicide. <laughs> sorry. Homicide is the only major cause of childhood death that has increased in incidence during the past 30 years. This is typically done by smothering or beatings. While we don't have any of the details of exactly what happened that morning, we do have bits of truth woven into the many confessions of Chris Watts. I believe Chris, feeling threatened by Shanian's words prior to the Arizona trip, where she told him he would never see the girls again, had, plan had planned to have a couple of friends. I believe that he had planned to have a couple of friends take the girls out the back door, and then he would rejoin them at a later time. Given the temperament of the girls, I don't see, you know, I don't see them going with strangers without fussing or saying, Daddy, no. Again, I believe there are truths embedded within his many confessions. But we don't have the full truth in the right order. Have you ever taken your child to the nursery at church, daycare, or the first day of school? Hand that child over to a stranger and you will more than likely hear, Mommy or Daddy, no. In my opinion, the fire stick meetup was an attempt to let the girls see those folks to establish some for form of comfort, you know, just like to make them more familiar to the girls. Yet, I may or may not have gone, excuse me, it may or may not have gone as smoothly as needed. I'd like to see the video footage of the lazy dog to see who they actually met up with during that meeting. In addition to the text messages on Chris. Chris's phone between Shani and Cindy and, well, pretty much everyone else leading up to the murders. Did Shani and wake up during this commotion to witness the hell of what her life was quickly becoming as her kids were taken out the back door? Is this when another argument took place? According to Chris, she said, F you, F you, and F you. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a minimum of three people in that room and she wouldn't be saying that to the girls. Chris says something in his interview at the police station, in quote, I can't believe she hit my kids. The kids, as far as Chris was concerned on Monday, in my opinion, he thought they were safe. At what point did he learn about, you know, one of them being hit? We see in the sentencing hearing quite a bit of emotion from Chris as he learns firsthand of Bella's injuries. His statement, I didn't hurt my girls, 
yeah, because it it's not coming back on my hands, are statements that Chris made in that, in my opinion, they're honest statements. Go watch the behavior panel and listen to what they say as they teach you how to determine what's an honest response, etc. I highly, highly recommend that channel. Some will say, how is this possible? Well, think about it. Police were all over Chris on Monday. Monday, they didn't know about the mistress or anyone else for that matter. There was plenty of time for someone to take the girls out to survey. Dogs never hit on Chris's truck, yet there are other trucks and vehicles that were more than available and capable of aiding in this part. This would explain Chris's behavior during the interviews. Is it possible he had absolutely nothing to do with the murders and was under the impression that Shanian really had left with the kids? Again, I'm not saying he's not where he's supposed to be, but keep in mind all law enforcement had was a theory, according to law enforcement. My own children were able to point out where Shanian was at Survey 319 just by looking at the photo. Guys, it's not rocket science to look on that photo and figure out where the dirt had been disturbed and it literally looks like someone was buried right there so you can see it when you look at the photo it wasn't hard to spot he even asked them what time it was taken which is interesting to me because i'd like to ask chris why in the world he asked that question still there's so many questions and not enough evidence processed to eliminate some of them according to colorado law it's not unlawful to take your children and relocate with them. Yes, there will eventually be a hearing to work out custody, but if Chris had help with them, like if Chris had had help with taking the kids out of the back and then, you know, basically there's no crime that was committed at that time. The girls could have been taken to a safe place and then all hell broke loose at home. Once the first murder occurred, it became criminal and the responsibility all fell on Chris is to not bring down his accomplices and negatively impact their families. Did a coworker take the girls out to survey to hand them off to Chris and they saw him burying Shanann? At that moment, they saw too much. They, meaning the girls. Questions upon questions remain, however, one thing's for certain. Chris could have had three people in that house taking the girls and there would have been nothing law enforcement could have done. There were there would be no additional charges there weren't accomplices to the crime they were just assisting a friend with getting his daughters it bothers me that chris didn't even seem to really recall even shanian's death his description of her doesn't match the autopsy at all his reaction to bella's injuries was a genuine shock in my opinion while i don't believe this is the exact way things happened that morning it is an option that hasn't really been explored from a legal perspective at some point, this went from friends helping a friend out to a crime. Once that moment is established, then the decision to charge or not to charge anyone else can be made. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, and did something that seemed random begin to stand out to you in this case? If so, what was it? Don't forget the links for the peer review journal will be listed in the description below. Hit that like and subscribe button, please, and don't forget to check out parts one through four. Thank you.